The Time Axis by Henry Kuttner Part 1 Chapter 1 Encounter in Rio The whole thing never happened, and I can prove it, now. But Ira DeKalb made me wait a billion years to write the story. So we start with a paradox. But the strangest thing of all is that there are no real paradoxes involved. Not one. This is a record of logic. Not human logic, of course. Not the logic of this time or this space. I don't know if men will ever journey again, as we journeyed to that intersection of latitude and longitude where a shell hangs forever. Forever and yet not forever, in space and out of space, on the axis stretching through time from beginning to end. From the dawn of the nebulae to the twilight of absolute entropy, when the framework of the cosmos has broken down into chaos, still that axis will stretch from dawn to dusk, from beginning to end. For as this world spins on an axis through space, so the sphere of time spins on its own axis. I never understood the ultimate answer. That was beyond me. It took the combined skills of three great civilizations far apart in time, to frame that godlike concept in which the tangible universe itself was only a single factor. And even then, it was not enough. It took the face of EA, which I shall never be able to describe fully. I saw it, though. I saw it, luminous in the reddish dusk, speaking to me silently above the winds that scour perpetually across the dead, empty lands of a day yet to come. I think it will stand there forever in an empty land on a dead planet, watching the endless night draw slowly on through days as long as years. The stars will stand, and the earth necropos will stand, and the face will stand there forever. I was there. I saw it. Was there? Will be. Maybe. I can't tell now. But of all stories in the world, this more than any needs a pattern. Since the beginning is in the past, before men as such existed at all, the only starting place I know is a temporal and personal one, when I was drawn into the experiment. Now that I know a little more about the nature of time, it seems clearer to me that past, present, and future were all stepping stones, arranged out of sequence. The first step took place two months ago. That was here, in this time and space. Or in the time and space that existed two months ago. There's been a change. Now this is the way it used to be. For me, the big ride. You start when you're born. You climb on the toboggan, and then you're off. But you can only have the one ride. No use telling the ticket taker you want to go again. They shovel you under at the end of the slope, and there's a new lot of passengers waiting. You've had your three score and ten, and it's over. I'd ridden the toboggan for thirty-five years. Jeremy Cortland. Jerry Cortland of the Denver Post. The Frisco Call Bulletin. P. A. P. Time. Callsers. Sometimes staff. Sometimes roving assignments. I leaned out of the toboggan and plucked fruit from the orchards as I sped by. Strange fruit sometimes. Generic term is news. And that covers a lot of territory. There was a splinter in the toboggan seat. I had on red flannel underwear. I had a nervous tick. I couldn't sit still. I kept reaching out, grabbing. Years of it, of bylines that said cabled by Jeremy Cortland. Russia, China, war coverage, Picard's Bathyscaphe, the supersonic and alto stratosphere planes, the Russian earth borer gadget, the big eye at Palomar, the coal strikes and the cracker lynchings, and that dirt farmer in North Dakota who suddenly began to work miracles. His, his patients didn't stay cured, you remember, and he disappeared. The big ride. In between, I grabbed at other things. One marriage, one divorce, and more and more bulges, long bouts between assignments. I didn't give a... Well, you can't use that word in some papers. But it was all right. What did I expect, Heaven? The eyes aren't quite as clear as they used to be. The skin under them is a little puffy. One chin begins to be not quite enough. But it's still the big ride, with a splinter in the seat. Dodging alimony payments, I skipped to Brazil, 
got in on a submarine exploration of the Amazon, wrote it up, sold it to Op as a feature. The first installment appeared on the same day as another little item, buried in the back, that said 85 and 87 had been made artificially. Astatine and Francium, the missing link in the periodic table, two billion years ago, you could have picked up all the astatine and francium you wanted, just by reaching down and grabbing, if you'd been around at the time. Since then, 85 and 87 have decayed into other elements. But Seaborg and Giorso at UC made them synthetically, with the big cyclotron and atomic oven transmutation, and the column on one side of that trivial item said second burn death victim found, and on the other, there was a crossword puzzle. I didn't care either. Those deaths, by an indefinable sort of burning, were just starting to confound the United States authorities at the time. They hadn't yet spread to South America. There was another item in that same parar that concerned me, though I didn't know it at the time. Seemed that Ira de Kalb was working with military intelligence on some sort of highly secret project. So secret you could read all about it as far. South as Rio, if you had the price of the paper. I had my own current problem and it was a very odd one. The thing started six weeks before it began. You'll have to get used to paradox, which isn't paradox, once you grasp the idea. It started in an alley in Rio, a little cobbled tunnel opening off the Rua do Vidor. And what I was doing there at three o'clock of a summer morning in January, I'll never be able to tell you. I'd been drinking. Also, I'd been playing Chemin de Fer, and there was a thick pad of banknotes in the inside pocket of my white jacket, another stuffed into the dark wine-colored cummerbund I was wearing. Looking down, I could see the toes of my shoes twinkling in the moonlight as I walked. The sky twinkled too, and the lights up in the hills and out on the bay. The world was a shiny place revolving gently around me. I was rich, but this time it was going to last. This time I'd cut out the binges and take a little house up in Petropolis, where it's cool, and I'd really get down to work on the analysis of news coverage I'd been planning for so long. I'd made up my mind. I was drunk, but I'd be sober again, and the resolution would stay behind when the liquor died. I don't often get these fits of decision, but when they come, they're valid enough, and I knew this one was serious. That was a turning point in the career of Jerry Cortland. There in the moonlight on the checkered pavement. What happened at the mouth of that alley, I'll never really know. Fortunately for me, I couldn't see or realize it clearly, being drunk. It sprang from the deep shadow and put out two arms at me. That much I'm sure of. Two arms that never touched me. They never meant to. They shot past my ears, and I heard a thin hissing noise, and something seemed to turn over in my mind, leisurely like a deep-buried thought stirring to life. I could all but feel it move. I touched it. I wish I hadn't. But I was thinking of my money. My hand closed on the thing. On a part of it, no one will ever know on just what. I will only tell you it was smooth with a smoothness that burned my hand. Friction burned it, I think now. I think now. The sheer velocity of the thing, though it was not then moving perceptibly, took a neat thin layer of cuticle off my palm wherever it touched. I think it slid out of my grip on a thin lubrication of my own skin. You know how it is when you touch something white hot. For an instant it may feel cold. I didn't know I was burned. I closed my hand hard on the, on whatever it was I had hold of, and the very pressure of the grip seemed to push it away out of my hand, very smooth and fast. All I know is that a moment later I stood there, shaking my band because it stung and watching something dark in the moonlight vanish down the street with a motion that frightened me. I was too dazed to shout. By the time my wits came back, it had disappeared, and the feeling of unreality it left behind made me doubt whether I had ever seen or felt it at all. About ten minutes later, I found my money was gone. So it wasn't a turning point in my life after all. If things had worked out any differently, I never would have met Ira DeKalb. I never would have got myself mixed up in that series of deaths which so far as I was concerned were only singposts pointing the way to DeKalb. Maybe it was a turning point at that. 
the mind as well as the senses can be awfully slow sometimes. The hand doesn't know it has been burned. The mind can't recognize the impossible when it confronts it. There are many little refuges for a mind that must not admit to itself the impossible has happened. I went back to my hotel that night and got into bed. I had met a thief, I told myself drowsily, as I deserved, walking a city street that late at night, loaded down with cash. I had it coming. He would got my money, and that was that. He, it, hadn't touched the money or me, except in that one brief unbalanced instant. The thing was impossible, but since it had happened, then it was possible, and the mind could dismiss it. I went to sleep, and woke at dawn to the most extraordinary experience I'd ever had in my life, up to then. Even that encounter on the Rua du Vidor hadn't been like this. The experience was pure sensation, and the sensation was somewhere inside me, vaguely in the solar plexus region. A soundless explosion of pure energy, like a dazzling sun coming into sudden radiant being. There aren't any accurate words to tell about it, but I was aware of ring after ring of glowing vitality bursting outward from that nova in the deepest nerve center of my body. For a timeless instant, I lay there, bathed in it, feeling it pour like a new kind of blood through my veins. In that instant I knew what it was, then somebody turned off the power at its source. I sat up abruptly, empty of the radiance, empty as it had never happened, but filled terribly with the knowledge of what had caused it. My head ached from the sudden motion. Dawn made the skylight outside and brimmed the room with a clear gray luminous pallor. I sat there holding my head in both hands and knowing, knowing that somewhere in the city an instant ago a man had been killed. There was no shadow of doubt in my mind. I was as sure as if I had had that strange sensation a hundred times before and each time seen a man die as it burst into a nova glow inside me. I wanted to go back to sleep and pretend it had been a dream, but I knew I couldn't. I dragged myself out of bed and into my clothes. I took my aching head and jangled nerves down into the street and found a yawning taxi driver. You see, I even knew where the dead man would be found. It was unthinkable that I should go there looking for him, but I went, and I found him. He was lying huddled against the rim of a fountain in a little square not far from the place where I'd last seen my, my thief, of the night before vanishing with that disquieting smooth swiftness in the moonlight. The dead man was an Indian, probably a beggar. I stood there in the deserted square, looking down at him hearing the early morning traffic moving noisily past, knowing someone would find us here together at any moment. I had never seen a victim of the burn death before, but I knew I looked at one now. It wasn't a real burn, properly speaking. Friction, I though, had done it. The eroded skin made me think of something, and I looked at my own palm. I was standing there, staring from my burned hand to the dead man, and then back again, when it happened again. The bursting nova of pure radiance flared into, violent somewhere near the pit of my stomach. Vitality poured through my veins. I sold the series to AP as usual. There had been five of the murders in Rio before I got my idea about putting an end to them, and by then the stories had begun to hit the state's papers. Some of them running my picture along with the sensational stuff about the deaths and my ununt. Canny ability at locating the bodies. Looking back now, I suppose the only reason they didn't arrest me for murder was that they couldn't figure out how I'd done it. Luckily, my hand had healed before the police and the papers began to connect me so tightly with the deaths. After the fifth murder, I got a reservation for New York. I had come to the conclusion that if I left Rio, the murders would stop. In Rio. I thought they might begin again in New York. I had to find out, you see. By then, I was in pretty bad shape for the best of reasons, or the worst. Anyhow, I went back. Chapter 2. The Stain in the Stone. There was a message waiting for me at the airport. Robert J. Allister wanted to see me. I felt impressed. Allister runs a chain of news and picture magazines, second only to life and time. I phoned for an appointment, 
and they told me to come right up. I walked through a waiting room full of people with prior appointments, and they passed me right into the sanctum, with no preliminaries. I began to wonder if I'd been underestimating my own importance all these years. Alistair himself rose behind his desk and offered me his hand. I waded forward ankle-deep through Persian carpets and took it. He told me to sit down. His voice was tired and he looked thinner and more haggard than his pictures. So you're Jerry Cortland, he said. Been following your Rio stuff. Nice work. Care to drop it for a while? I gaped. He gave me a tired grin. I'd like you to work for me on contract, he said. Let me explain. You know, Ira de Kalb, the poor man's Einstein. In a way, maybe. He's a dilettante. He's a genius, really, I suppose. A mind like a grasshopper. He'll work out a whole new concept of mathematics and never bother to apply it. He... Well, you'll understand better after you've met him. He's on to... Something very new just now. Something very important. I want some pieces written on it, and de Kalb made a point of asking for you. But why... He has his reasons. He'll explain to you. Maybe. I can't. He pushed the contract toward me. How about it? Well, I hesitated. My ex-wife had just slapped another summons on me. Alimony again. And I could certainly use some money. I'll try it, I said. But I'm irresponsible. Maybe I won't stick to it. You'll stick. You'll stick. Alista said grimly. Once you've talked to DeKalb that I can guarantee. Sign here. DeKalb's house blended into the hillside as if Frank Lloyd Wright had built it with his own hands. I was out of breath by the time I got to the top of the gray stone terraces linked together by gray stone steps. A maid let me in and showed me to a room where I could wait. Mr. DeKalb is expecting you, she said. He'll be back in about ten minutes. Half the room was glass looking out upon miles and miles of Appalachians, tumbled brown and green, with a dazzling sky above. There was somebody already there, apparently waiting too. I saw the outlines of a woman's spare, straight figure rising almost apologetically from a desk as I entered. I knew her by that air of faint apology no less than by her outline against the light. Dr. Essen, I said, and I was aware then of my first feeling of respect for this job whatever it was. You don't get two people like Letta Essen and Ira de Kalb under the same roof for anything trivial. I knew Dr. Essen. I'd interviewed her twice, right after Hiroshima, about the work she'd done with Meitner and Frisch in establishing the nuclear liquid drop concept of atomic fission. I wanted very much to ask her what she was doing here, but I didn't. I knew I'd get more out of her if I let it come her way. Mr. de Kalb asked me to meet you, Mr. Cortland she said in her pleasant soft voice. Hello, it's nice to see you again. You've been having quite a time in Rio, haven't you? Old stuff now, I said. This looks promising if you're in on it. What's up anyhow? She gave me that shy smile again. She had a tired, gentle face. Gray curls cut very short, gray eyes like two flashes of light off a steel beam when she let you meet her direct gaze. Mostly she was too shy. But when you caught that rare quick glance of her, it was almost frightening. You realized then the hard, dazzling mind behind the eyes. I'll let Mr. DeKalb tell you all about that, she said. It isn't my secret, but you're involved more than you know. In fact, she paused, not looking at me, but giving the corner of the carpet a gentle scowl. In fact, I'd like to show you something. We've got a little time to spare and I want your reaction to, to something. Come with me, and we'll see. Come, come with me, and we'll see. I followed her out into the hall, down a flight of steps, and then into a big room, comfortably furnished. A study, I thought. But the bookshelves were empty now, and everything was lightly filmed with dust. The fireplace, Mr. Cortland, Dr. Fee, Essen said, pointing. It was an ordinary fireplace, gray stone in the pine-paneled wall, with a gray stone hearth. But there seemed to be a stain at one spot on the hearth, close to the wall. I stepped closer. Then, 
I knelt to look. The speed of a chain of thoughts comes as close as anything I know to annihilating time itself. The images that flashed through my mind seemed to come all at once. I saw the stain. I thought. There was no overt reason, but I thought it. And then before I could take it in clearly with my conscious mind, in the chambers of the unconscious I was standing again at the alley mouth in Rio, at three in the morning, seeing a dark thing leap forward at me with its two hands outstretched. I heard the thin humming in my ears, felt the burning of its touch. I remembered the sunburst of violent energy deep inside me that had heralded murder whenever it came. And I knew that all these were one. All these and the stain upon the hearth. The knowledge came unbidden without reason, but it was sure. I didn't question it. But I looked very closely at the stone. That stain was an irregular area where the stone seemed changed into another substance. I didn't know what the substance was. It looked wholly unfamiliar. The gray of the hearth stopped abruptly, along an irregular pattern, and gave place to a substance that seemed translucent, shot through with veins and striae that were lighter, like the veins in marble. The pine panels beside the fireplace were partly stained like the stone and a little area of the carpet that came up to the edge of the hearth. Wood, stone, and cloth alike had turned into this, this marble stain. The veins in it were like tangled hair, curling together embedded like some strange neural structure in half-transparent flesh. I looked up. Don't touch it, Dr. Essen said quickly. I didn't mean to. I didn't need to. I didn't need to. I knew what it would feel like. I knew that, though it was perfectly motionless, it would burn my hand with friction if I touched it. Dr. Essen knew, too. I saw that in her face. I stood up. What is it? I asked my voice sounding oddly thin. The Necron, she told me, almost absently. She was searching my face and the keenness of her gaze was almost painful to meet. That's Mr. de Kalb's word for it, as good a word as any. It's a new type of matter. Mr. Cortland, you have seen something like this before? Her rare, direct look was like the sharpness of a knife going through me, cold and deep. Maybe. Maybe. Mm. I said, no, never, really, but, all right, I understand. She nodded. I wanted to verify something. I verified it. Thank you. She turned away toward the door. We'd better get back. No, please, no questions yet. I can't possibly explain until after you've seen the record. The record? What? What? It's something that was dug up in Crete. It's peculiar, but thoroughly convincing. You'll see it soon. Shall we go back? She locked the door behind us. Certainly DeKalb didn't look his 47 years any more than a Greek statue does. He looked like a young man, big and well-proportioned. His sleek hair lay flat and short upon his head, and his face was handsome in the vacant way the Belvedere's is. There was no latent expression upon it, and you felt that no emotions had ever drawn lines about the mouth or between the brows. Either he had never felt any or his control was such that he could suppress all feeling. There was the same placidity you see in the face of Buddha. There was something odd about his eyes. I couldn't make out their color. They seemed to be filmed as though with a cat's third eyelid. Light blue, I thought, or gray, and curiously dull. He gave me a strong handshake and collapsed into an overstaffed chair, hoisted his feet to a hassock. Grunting, he blinked at me with his dull stare. There was a curious clumsiness to his motions, and when he spoke, a curious ponderous quality in his diction. He seemed to feel something like indulgent contempt for the rest of the world. It was all right, I suppose. Nobody had better reason. The man was a genius. Glad you're here, Mr. Cortland, he said hoarsely. I need you. Not for your intelligence, which is slight. Not for your physical abilities, obviously sapped by years of wasteful and juvenile dissipation. But I have an excellent reason to think we may work well together. I was sent to get an interview for spread, I told him. 
You were not. DeKalb raised a forefinger. You err through ignorance, sir. Robert Allister, the publisher of Spread, is a friend of mine. He has money. He has agreed to do the world and me a service. You are under contract to him, so you do as he says. He says you will work with me. Is that clear? Lucid, I told him. Except I don't work that way. The contract says I'm to handle news assignments. I read the fine print, too. There was no mention of pionage. This is a news assignment. I shall give you an interview. But first, the record. I see no point in futile discussion. Dr. Essen, will you be kind enough? He nodded toward a cupboard. She got out a parcel wrapped in cloth, handed it to Decal. He held it on his knee, unopened, tapped his fingers on its top. It was about the size and shape of a portable typewriter case. I have showed the contents of this, he said, only to Dr. Essen, and I am convinced, Dr. Essen said dryly. Oh yes, Ira, I am convinced I now I show it to you, DeKalb said, and held out the package, put it on the table. So, now draw up a chair, remove the wrappings. Excellent. And now, they were both leaning forward, watching me expectantly. I glanced from them to the battered box, then back again. It was a tarnished blue-white rectangle, battered, smudged with dirt, perfectly plain. It is of no known metal, DeKalb said. Some alloy, I think. It was found fifteen years ago in an excavation in Crete and sent to me unopened. Not intentionally. Nobody has ever been able to open it until recently. It is, as you may have guessed, a puzzle box. It took me fourteen years to learn the trick that would unlock it. It is also apparently indestructible. I shall now perform the trick for you. His hands moved upon the battered surface. I saw his nails whiten now and then as he put pressure on it. Now, he said, he said, it opens, but I shall not watch. Letta, will you? No. I think it will be better for us both if we look away while Mr. Cortland... I stopped listening along about then. For the box was slowly opening. It opened like a jewel. Or like an unfolding flower that had as many facets as a jewel. I had expected a lid to lift, but nothing of the sort happened. There was movement. There were facets and planes sliding and shifting and turning as though hinged but what had seemed to be a box changed and reassembled and unfolded before me until it was, what? As much a jewel as anything. Angles, planes, a shape and a shining. Simultaneously, there was motion in my own mind. As a tuning fork responds to a struck note, so something like a vibration bridged the gap between the box and my brain. As a book opens, as leaves turn, a book opened and leaves turned in my mind. All time compressed itself into that blinding second. There was a shifting reorientation, motions infinitely fast that fitted and meshed with such precision the book and my mind were one. The record opened itself inside my brain. Complete, whole, a history and a vision, it hung for that one instant, lucid and detailed in my mind. And for that moment, outside time, I did comprehend. But the mind could not retain it all. It flashed out and burned along my nerves, and then it faded and was only a pulse, a glimpse, hanging on like an afterimage in my memory. I had seen and forgotten. But I had not forgotten everything. Across a gulf of inconceivable eons, a face looked at me from red sky and empty earth. The face of E.A., the room spun around me. Here, Dr. Essen's voice murmured at my shoulder. I looked up dizzily, took the glass of brandy she offered. I'm not sure now whether or not I had a moment of unconsciousness. I know my eyes blurred and the room tilted before me. I drank the brandy gratefully. Chapter 3. The Vision of Time. DeKalb said, tell us what you saw. You, you've seen it too. The brandy helped, but I wasn't yet steady. 
I didn't want to talk about what had flashed through my mind in that unending, dissolving glimpse which was slipping fragment by fragment out of my memory as I sat there. And yet I did want to talk. I've I men want to talk. Seen it. De Kalb's ponderous nod was grim. Letta Essen has seen it. Now you. Three of us. We all get the same thing, and yet, details differ. Three witnesses to the same scene tell three different stories. Each sees with a different brain. Tell us how it seemed to you. I swirled the brand around in my glass. My thoughts swirled with it, hot and potent as the liquor and as volatile. Give me ten minutes more, I thought, and they'll evaporate. Red sky, I said slowly. Empty landscape. And... The word stuck in my throat. I couldn't name it. The face, de Kalb supplied impatiently. Yes, I know. Go on. The face of Ie, I said. How do I know its name? A and time, time. Suddenly the brandy splashed across my hand. I was shaking with reaction so violent I could not control it, and I was shaking because of time. I got the glass to my lips, using both hands, and drained what was left. The second reaction passed, and I thought I had myself under control. Time, I said deliberately, letting the thought of it pour through my mind in a long, cold, dark-colored tide that had no motion. Time hasn't, of course, but when you see it, as I did, at id. First the concept makes the brain rock in your skull. Time, ahead of our time, uncountable thousands of years in our future. It was all there, wasn't it? The civilizations rising and falling one after another until the last city of all. The city of the face. You saw it was a city? DeKalb leaned forward quickly. That's good. That's very good. It took me three times to find that out. It didn't see it. I... I just knew. I closed my eyes. Before me the empty landscape floated, dark, almost night, under the dim red sky. I knew the face was enormous. The side of some mountain had been carved away to reveal it, and I supposed, carved with tools by human hands. But you had the feeling that the face must always have been there, that one day it had wakened in the rock and given one great grimace of impatience, and the mountainside had sloughed away from its features, leaving Ea to look out into eternity over the red night of the world. There are people inside, I said. I could feel them being there. Feel their thoughts, I suppose. People in an enormous city, a metropolis behind the face. Not a metropolis, de Kalb said. A necropolis. There's a difference. But, yes, it's a city. Streets, I said dreamily, sniffing the empty glass. Levels of homes and public buildings. People moving, living. Necropolis? Tell you later. Go on. It's fading. I closed my eyes again, thinking of the face. I had to force my mind to turn around in its tracks and look for I didn't want to confront that infinite complexity again. The face was painful to see. It was too intricate, too involved, with emotions complex beyond our grasp. It was painful for the mind to think of it, straining to understand the inscrutable things that experience had etched upon those mountain-high features. Is it a portrait? I asked suddenly. Or a composite? What is the face? A city, de Cobb said. A nation the ultimate in human destiny, and a call for help, and much more that we'll never understand. But the future, I said, that box, didn't you say it was found in Crete? Dug up in old ruins? How could something from the past be a record of our own future? It doesn't make sense. Very little makes sense, sir, when you come to examine the nature of time. De Kalb's voice was ponderous again. He heaved himself up a little and folded his thick fingers, looking at me above them with veiled gray eyes. Have you read Spengler, Mr. Cortland? He asked. I grimaced and nodded. I know, 
I know. He has a high irritant value. But the man had genius, just the same. His concept of the community, moving through its course from culture to dead and petrifying civilization, is what happened to the city of the face. I said happened because I have to use the past tense for that necropolis of the future. It exists. It has accomplished itself in time as fully as Babylon or Rome. And the men in it are not men at all in the sense we know. They are gods. He looked at me as if he expected me to object. I said nothing. They are gods, he went on. Spengler was wrong, of course, in thinking of any human progress in one simple romantic curve. You have only to compare 14th century Rome with 16th century Rome to see that a necropolis, as Mumford calls it, can pull itself together and become a metropolis again, a living, vital unit in human culture. I have no quarrel with Spengler in his interpretations of a culture within itself, but both he and Toynbee went astray in their ideas of the symbolic value of a city. When you go further into the record, you'll see what I mean, he paused put out a large hand and fumbled in a dish of fruit on the table at his elbow. He found an orange and peered at it dubiously, hefted it once or twice, then closed his fingers, then closed his fingers, over it and went on with his discourse. In a moment he said, I want to show you something with this orange as an illustration. First, however, I must do Spengler the justice of allowing the validity of his theories in the ultimate. The city of the face has run its course. It is a necropolis, in the sense that Mumford uses the term. In our times, a necropolis such as Rome once was, and such as New York must be some day, needn't mean the end of our civilization, because a city isn't a whole nation. There were outlying villages that flourished all the better when Rome ceased to dominate their world. When the Dark Ages closed over Europe, it wasn't by any means the end of the civilized world. Elsewhere on the planet new cultures were rising and old ones flourishing. But the city of the face is a very different matter. That, that, city is really necropolis and there are no outlying villages to carry on, no outlying cultures rising toward fruition. In all that world, there is only the one great city where mankind survives. And they aren't men. They are gods. Gods, sir. Then it can't really be a necropolis, I objected. It need not be. That's up to us. How? You saw my hearth. Dr. Essen showed you the stain of plague that is creeping across it. Oh yes, my friend, that stain is spreading. Slowly. But with a rate of growth that increases as it goes. The negative matter, no, not even negative, not even that. But it happened to the world of the face. That whole planet is necronic matter except for the city itself. You didn't sense that from your first experience with the record? No, you will. The people in the city can't save themselves by direct action on the world around them. They appeal to us. We can save them. I don't yet know how, but they know or... They wouldn't have appealed in just the way they did. Wait a minute, I said. Let me get this straight. You're asking me to accept a lot, you know. The only premise I've got to believe in is the... the record. But what do you want from me, personally? How do I come into it? Why me? De Kalb shifted in his chair, sighed heavily, opened his fingers and peered at the orange he held, as if he had never seen it before. He grimaced. Sir, you're right. I accept the rebuke. Let me give you facts. Item, the record. It is in effect a book. But not a book made by human minds. And it must, as you know, be experienced, not read. Each time you open the box, you will get the same flash of complete vision. And each time you will forget a little less as your mind is conditioned but there will always be facets of that tremendous story which will elude us, I think. Our minds can never wholly grasp what lies inside that box. It was found in Crete. It had lain there perhaps 3,000 years, perhaps 5,000, 
I think myself a million. It came into my hands half by accident. I could not open it. Off and on I tried. That is my habit. I used x-rays to look through the substance of the box. Of course, I saw nothing. I detected radioactivity, and I tested it with certain of the radio elements. I exposed it to supersonics. I... Well, I tried many things. Something worked. Something clicked the safety, so that one day it opened. You see... You... He looked at me gravely. You see, it was time. Time? That box was made with a purpose, obviously. It was sent to us with a message. I say to us, but the aim was less direct. It was sent through time, Mr. Cortland, through time itself, and the address said simply, to be opened only by a skilled, technological civilization. All right, I said. Suppose it came through time. Suppose it's an appeal for help. I didn't get that, but I'm willing to believe I might if I open the box often enough. But why do you assume this is a living issue, here and now? You imply the fate of the city did I. Epens on us. If that box is as old as you say, isn't it more likely the city of the face existed somewhere in the prehistoric past? They made a record. I can't deny that. They cast it adrift in time like a note in a bottle, and it floated ashore here and we read it. Sure, but it makes a good enough news story for me, the logical way. A relic of a dead civilization a million years old. That I could write. But you are not here to write a news story, sir. DeKalb's voice was sharp. That's what my contract says I'm here for. You were chosen, DeKalb said heavily. You were chosen, not by Alistair. Not by me, he shifted uneasily. Let me go on a little. He peered at the orange, tossed it up and caught it with a smack in his palm. I opened the box for the first time, he said, in my studio. You've seen it. I saw the box unfolding like a flower, for the first time in a million years, opening up in four dimensions, or perhaps more than four, with that tesseract motion which the eye can only partly see. But that first time, sir? One thing more happened, he paused, hesitated, said in a reluctant voice. Something came out of the box. I waited. Doctor? Essen, who had scarcely moved since this talk began, got up abruptly and went to stand at the window. Her back to us, looking out over the great brown tumble of mountains beyond. It came out of the box. De Kalb said in a rapid voice, as if he didn't want to talk about this, and was determined to get it over as fast as he could. It passed me. It leaped toward the fireplace, and it was gone. When I looked, I saw nothing. But that evening I noticed the first spot of the stain upon the stone. In the stone, it meant little to me then. I had not yet learned enough from the V. Record to be afraid, but I know now. Chapter 4. The Laurentian Story. Again, I waited. This time... I had to prompt him. No what? The Necron, he said. It's growing. It will never stop growing until... He paused, shrugged. We have to believe they're in the future, he said. We have to help them. They made sure of that. For unless we do, the Necron will grow and grow until our world is like theirs. Dead matter. Inert. Inert. Necronic. I call it that because it is death, an absolutely new form of matter, the death of energy. It breaks the supreme law of our universe, the law of increasing entropy. Entropy trends toward chaos, naturally. But the Necron is the other extreme, a pattern, a dead null energy pattern of negation. You mean, I demanded that the people of the city deliberately set a trap for the man who first opened the box? They had to. They had to make sure we'd answer their appeal to save ourselves. Then you're convinced they exist in the future, not the past. You saw the face. You were aware, you say, of the waves of civilization rising and falling between our time and theirs? How can you doubt it then, Mr. Cortland? I was silent, remembering. 
It doesn't matter, DeKalb went on. That question is purely academic. Past or future is all one in the time fabric you will understand better after you've opened the box again. But, I said, how can we help them? If they can't destroy the menace to their own world, whatever it is, how could we? It's ridiculous. And anyhow, if time travel was possible for the box, which I don't for a moment really accept, how could it be possible for tangible living men from our time? And if it were, how could you be sure you weren't dashing off to save a city that would prove when you found it to be already dead, overwhelmed a million years ago? How is it? No, no, Mr. Cortland. DeKalb held up a large hand with an orange balanced on its palm. You have so much to learn. Allow me the intelligence to think of those objections myself. Surely you don't imagine all that hadn't occurred to me already. The answer is that the Necron can be destroyed, or at least, that the problem it poses can be solved. I believe it can be solved only by this method. Three men and one woman must go into the future age that holds the face of EA. For that, a pace of EA, apparently, was the original plan of the people of the face. What makes you so certain of that? A number of factors. The record was sent to our civilization, remember? I had him there. But it was found in Cretan ruins, you said. Certainly. And the ancient Minoans didn't open it. I suspect the record existed long before the time of Theseus, but it remained unopened until a neo-technical civilization had developed on this planet. Only men and women who were products of a... Such a culture would have the qualities necessary to solve the necronic problem. Why didn't they send the record directly to our era? Why did they miss the right time by thousands of years? I am no expert in the specialized restrictions of time traveling, DeKalb said, with some irritation. It may be that too accurate aim is impossible. How can I tell that? The record reached the right hands. I can easily prove that. But I was searching for errata. You said we'd have the qualities that could solve the necronic problem. Destroy it, I suppose you mean. Well, have you solved it? De Kalb lost his ill temper and beamed at me. No, he said. Not yet. The necronic matter itself is very curious. Atypical, completely. It is absolutely non-reactive. It has no spectrum. It emits no energy. No known regent affects it in the slightest degree. It is a new type of matter, plain and simple. I cannot destroy it, not yet, not now. But I believe I can do it with the guidance and aid of the people of the face. As a matter of, the telephone on the table beside him buzzed sharply. Dr. Essen swung around with a start. DeKalb grunted, nodded at her muttered. I'm afraid so, as if in answer to a question and took up the telephone with his free hand. It sputtered at him. All right, put him on, DeKalb said in a resigned voice. The receiver buzzed and sputtered again. DeKalb's placid features grimaced, smoothed out, grimaced again. Now Murray, he said. Now Murray, he said. No, wait a minute. Confound it, Murray. Allow me to. I know you are, but... The telephone would not let him speak. It crackled angrily, a word now and then coming out clearly. DeKalb listened in resigned silence. Finally, he heaved himself up in the chair and spoke with sudden resolution. Murray. Murray. He said sharply, Murray, listen to me. Cortland's here. The phone crackled. DeKalb grinned. I know you don't, he said. Probably Cortland doesn't like you either. That's not important. Murray, can you come up here? Yes, it is important. I have something to show you. He hesitated, glanced at Dr. Essen, shrugged. I am casting the die, Murray, he said. I am casting the die, Murray, he said. I want to show you a certain box. You know Colonel Harrison, Murray? DeKalb asked. I nodded. I knew and disliked him for personal qualities quite apart from his ability. He was old army, 
West Point. A martinet. He had the violent, uncontrolled emotions of an hysterical woman and the mechanical brilliance of a, well, a robot. No one could deny his genius. He prided himself on being scrupulously just, which he wasn't, but he thought he was. A fine technician, a genius at strategy and tactics. He confirmed that in the Pacific, back in 45, I'd done a profile on him once and he hadn't liked it at all. You're taking him in on this, I asked. I've got to. He can make it too hot for me unless he understands. You see, I've been working with him on... Never mind. But he insists I go on with it. He can't see how important this new business is, Ira, Dr. Essen put in timidly. Ira, do you really think it's wise? To bring the colonel in yet, I mean. Are you sure? You know I'm not, Letta. He frowned. But there's so little time to be lost now. I don't dare wait any longer. Mr. Cortland, he swung around toward me. Mr. Cortland, I see it is now time to give you one more bit of knowledge. I have a story to tell you, about myself and you. Surely you must have realized by now that you are involved in this thing far beyond any power of mine to accept or dismiss. I nodded. I did know that. I thought briefly of the things that had happened to me in Rio, of the affinity I had sensed without understanding between that stain on the hearthstone and the hearthstone, and the, the creature which had scorched my hand in Rio, and the deaths that had come after. Would they stop now, in Rio? Would they begin again, nearer home? There had to be some connection. Coincidence just doesn't stretch that far. But all I could do was wait. This is my story, DeKalb said. Our story, Mr. Cortland. Yours and mine, Dr. Essence. Perhaps Colonel Murray's too. I don't know. I wish I did. Well, I'll get on with it. He sighed heavily. After I had experienced the record many times, he said I began to realize that there was in it reference to a certain spot on the Earth's surface that had a rather mystifying importance. I was unable to grasp why. The place was localized by latitude, longitude, various methods of cross-reference. It took me a long while to work it out in terms of our own world, an era, and decimal system. But finally, I did it. I went there. He paused, regarding me gravely. Have you ever been in the Laurentians, Mr. Cortland? Do you know the wildness of those mountains? So near here by air, and so far off in another world, once you arrive and the sound of your motor ceases. You imagine then that you can hear the how silences of the Arctic wastes, which are all that lie beyond that band of northern forests. Well, I hired men. I sank a shaft. They thought I was simply a prospector with more money and fewer brains than most. Fortunately, they didn't know my real reason, that the spot I was hunting had turned out to be underground. You get some curious superstitions up there in the wilds, perhaps not curious. In many ways they're wise men, but my spot, in this era at least, had to be dug for. My instruments showed me a disturbance toward which the shaft was angled, and eventually we came to the source of that disturbance. We found it. We hollowed a cavern around it. After that I dismissed the men settled down to study the thing I settled down to study the thing I had found. He laughed abruptly. It was twenty feet of nothing, Mr. Cortland. An oval of disturbance, egg-shaped, cloudy to the eye. I could walk through it. But inside that oval, space and matter were walled off from our own space and matter by a barrier that was, I know now, supra-dimensional. A man may move from light to dark, encountering no barrier, yet the difference is manifest. There were tremendous differences here. Also, there was something inside. I was convinced of that long before I got my first glimpse of it. I tried many things. It was finally under a bombardment of UV that I saw the first shadowy shape inside that nothingness. I increased the power. I decreased it. I played with the vernier like a violinist on a Stradivarius. I chased that elusive mystery up and down through the light bands like a cat on a mouse's trail. And at last, quite clearly, I saw. Quite clearly, I saw. He broke off, grinning at me. No, I shall not tell you yet what I saw, he said. You wouldn't believe me. 
The moment has now come, Mr. Cortland, when I must give you a little lesson on the nature of time. He held up the orange, revolving it slowly between his fingers. A sphere, he said, revolving on an axis. Call it Earth. He put out his other hand and took up from the fruit bowl a silver knife with a leaf-shaped blade a little broader than the orange. With great deliberation, he slid the edge through the rind. Chapter 5. The Death Carriers. What happened then came totally without warning. In one moment I sat comfortably in my chair watching DeKalb drew the knife blade through the orange. In the next, a blinding nova of pure energy exploded outward from a nexus in the center of my body. The room ceased to be. DeKalb and Dr. Essen were unrealities far off at the periphery of that exploding nova. Vitality ran like fire through every nerve and vein, like an adrenaline charge inconceivably magnified. There was nothing in the world for one timeless moment of the bursting glow of that experience for which I have no name. The first thing I saw when the room came back into focus around me was the blood running from DeKalb's hand. It meant nothing to me in that first instant. Blood is the natural concomitant of death. And I knew that somewhere not far away a man had died a moment before. Then my senses came back, and I sat up abruptly. Staring at DeKalb's face, the color had drained out of it. He was looking at his cut hand with a blank, unseeing gaze. There was a little blood on the silver knife. It was nothing. He had only cut himself slightly because of... Because of... Our eyes met. I think the knowledge came simultaneously into our minds in that meeting of glances. He had felt it too. The explosion of white energy had burst outward in his nerve centers, in the same moment it burst in mine. Neither of us spoke. It wasn't necessary. After what seemed a long while I looked at Dr. Essen. That bright steel glance of hers met mine squarely, but there was only bewilderment in it. What happened? she asked. The sound of her voice seemed to release us both from our speechlessness. You don't know? DeKalb swung around to look at her. No, evidently you don't, but Mr. Cortland and I... Cortland, how often have you... He groped for words. Since the first of the deaths in Rio, I said flatly. You? Since the first of them here. Never since, though, very faintly, when they happened in Rio. What are you talking about? Dr. Essen demanded. Heavily, speaking with deliberation, DeKalb told her. For myself. He finished glancing at me. It began when I first opened the record. He paused, looked at his hand with some surprise, and, laying down orange and knife, pulled a handkerchief from his pocket and wrapped it around the bleeding cut. I didn't feel that at all, he said, almost to himself. And then to me, I opened the record. I told you that something went by me very fast and vanished at the spot where that necronic strain later came into existence. He looked at me soberly, his eyes narrowed. Mr. Cortland, his eyes narrowed. He said, can you tell me that you did not experience any feeling of recognition when you first saw that stain on the hearth? I got up so suddenly that my chair almost tipped over. Violently, I said to Kalb, somewhere a man has just died. Something killed him. Something is making you and me accessories to murder. We've got to put a stop to it. This isn't an academic discussion. It's murder. We win. Sit down, Mr. Cortland, sit down. De Kalb's voice was tired. I know quite well it's murder. We must and will discover the truth about it. But not by shouting at one another. The truth lies in that box on the table. It lies somewhere very far in the future. Also, the truth is a being that roams our world. V Murdering at will. I released it, Mr. Cortland. Unwittingly, but I released it. That was a Pandora's box I opened. Trouble and death came out of it. We can only pray that there is hope in the bottom of it, as there was in Pandora's box. Look, I said, tell me how I can help and I'll do it. But let's not have any more generalities. I'm too close to these deaths. I think I'm in personal danger. Maybe you are, too. What can we do? We are not in personal danger from the killer. From the law, perhaps. 
If this connection from which we suffer were to become known, what can we do? I wish I could tell you. I'm sure of this much, that thing which came from the box, leaving the stain of necronic matter like a footprint behind it, is a living and dangerous creature. It touched me as it went by. I think by that touch I've become, well, remotely akin to it. Were you touched too? I told him. Very well, he said. We are in danger. Has it occurred to you yet that where it touched the hearthstone, the necron took root? For a moment I didn't see what he meant. Then the implication hit me and I went cold and empty inside. De Kalb, seeing the look on my face, laughed shortly. I see it has. Very well. So far I haven't detected any sign of necronic infection in myself. I assume you haven't either. But that proves nothing. Have you seen the creature? I asked. He hesitated. I can't be sure. I think I have. Will you tell me exactly what happened to you, please? Every detail, even the irrelevant. And when I had finished, he exchanged troubled glances with Dr. Letta Essen. Directive intelligence, then, she said. The way it moved, DeKalb murmured. That's highly significant, and the impossibility of getting a firm grip on the creature. So, Letta, do you agree? Frictional burns, she asked. But it didn't move fast enough to cause those. That is... Not spatially. Not in space, no. In space, no. DeKalb said. But in time? Limited, of course. A few seconds leeway would be enough if you consider the energy expended and the tremendous velocities involved. It looks like a shadow. It seems to have mass without weight. And it has high velocity without weight. And it has high velocity without... Dashal motion and Mr. Cortland's tightening his grip on the creature seemed to push it away. Time movement, then. It vibrates. It has an oscillating period of existence, certainly limited within a range of a few seconds. A tuning fork vibrates in space. Why not vibration through time, with an extremely narrow range? No wonder you couldn't hold the creature. Could you hold a metal rod vibrating that rapidly? You would get frictional burns on your hands, since your own weight would prevent you from partaking of its motion. The being's existence must be, to a, limited degree, extra-temporal. Consequently, I suppose any weapon used against it would have to be key to its own temporal periodicity. That is, if we had had a pistol oscillating in time, we might be able to shoot the creature. But the hand that squeezed the trigger might have to be oscillating too, trembling like a leaf, I said. I know mine would be. He brushed that away. How intelligent is this killer? Is ego involved, or merely vampirism? If the creature read your mind, he grimaced. No, no, the missing factor is what the Necron itself is and its special qualities, and we don't know that. We probably never will until we go to the face of EA. I sighed. I sat down. I'd had too many jolts in the past half hour to feel very sure of myself. So we travel in time. I said wearily, Mr. Rayerly. De Kalb, you're crazy. He had enough energy left to chuckle rather wanly. You'll think me even crazier, sir, when I tell you what it was I saw down there under the mountain, in the cavern. But I must finish my demonstration before you'll be able to understand. Get on with it, then. He took up orange and knife again. He fitted the blade into the cut and finished the job of bisecting the fruit a little above its equator. The severed top half lay upon the blade as on a narrow plate. Below it he held the other half of the orange in place, so that it still maintained its unbroken sphere. Consider this blade flatland, he said. A world of two dimensions, intersecting the thread. E-dimensional sphere. Now if I revolve the lower half of the orange, you will please imagine that the upper half revolves with it. One fruit, you see. The axis remains immovable in relation to the plane in flatland. It intersects. Now, I cut this lower half again straight through. The same axis intersects the same point on this flatland. In other words, the special axis remains stable. You understand so far? No, I said. He grinned. 
tossed knife and fruit back into the bowl. It takes thinking, he said. Let me go on. Now time is also a sphere. Time revolves, and time has an axis, a single stable extension of a temporal point, drawn through past and future alike, intersecting them all, as that knife blade touched the orange everywhere in the Oromi. Thy wide blade touched the orange everywhere in the flatland dimension. And that, Mr. Cortland, is what makes travel in time theoretically valid. The theory of time travel usually ignores space. The traveler steps into some semi-magical machine, presses a button, and emerges a thousand years in the future. But on Earth, he snorted. In a thousand years, or a thousand days, or in one day, or one minute, this planet along with the whole solar system would have traveled far beyond its position at the moment the traveler entered his machine. But there is one point from which he could enter the machine, enter time itself, and be sure always of emerging on Earth. For each planet, I think, there is one single point, the spot in the Laurentians where I saw. What I saw was that point for our planet. It is the spot at which the axis of the timosphere intersects our own three-dimensional world. If it were possible to follow the line of the particular axis, you would move through time. Well, I believe there is movement, but along still. Another dimension, beyond this theoretical fourth, which is time, or supertime, call it a fifth. This much I'm sure of. If you could stay in the time axis indefinitely, the ultra-time drift would carry you into another era, through era beyond era, wherever other ages intersect the time axis. He shook his head. I admit I understand it. I don't understand it. Too clearly. It's a science beyond ours. However, I think I can explain the presence of the record box now. I believe the people of the Fae sent it back in a direction parallel to the time axis, which, remember, intersects the same area in space always, at any given moment. They sent it very far back, millennia into our past. As you say, like people tossing a message in a bottle into the stream of time. Look. He held up his hand, thumb and forefinger touching at the tips. Two times, my finger and thumb, but they touch at one point only. There you can cross, from the time of the face to, let us say, some thousands of years, B.C. This is vague again, and it is something I don't understand. The extension is a long understand. Still, another dimension. Possibly the ultra-sphere. This figurative fifth. But it's logical to suppose there would be such a limitation. There is in space... You can step spatially only into areas spatially adjoining yours. And in time, well, it may apply there too. All right, I said. Okay, up to now. I'll accept it. Now let's have the kicker. What was it you saw in your cave? DeKalb leaned back in his chair, regarding me with a grin. I saw you, Mr. Rin. Cortland, I gaped at him. His grin broadened. Yes, I saw you, lying all seep on the floor of the... the egg. I saw myself there too, asleep. I saw Dr. Essen. And lastly, I saw Colonel Harrison Murray. He looked at me with obscure triumph, his grin very wide. You're crazy, I said bluntly. You're thinking you've never been in a cavern under a Laurentian mountain, I suppose. Very likely. Nor has Dr. D Essen. Nor I imagine, Murray. But you will be, my friend. So will we all. The grin faded. Now the deep voice was graver. And we are all changed there in the egg. You understand that? We are older by a little. Not temporally, but in experience. You can see that on our faces. We have all passed through strange experiences. Good, bad, awe-inspiring, perhaps. And the men look tired older. But Dr. Essen looks strangely younger. He shrugged heavily. I don't attempt to explain it. I can only report what I saw. He smiled at me. 
Well, so much for that. Don't look so stunned, Mr. Cortland. I assure you it was yourself, which means that you will go with us when we take our great leap into the future, into the world of the face. I believe we will all stand together in the future, living flesh before that great face we have seen only in our minds today. Believe? I know it. Those people lying asleep in the time axis, with instruments on the floor around them to regulate their slumbers, will go forward in time, have gone forward, and they will return in the end to here and now. They will go as the box went, from the here and now, forward through the time axis to the world of the face. But there is no backward flow along that axis. No one can risk meeting himself in his own past, even if such a thing were possible. So, when we return, we must come as the box did, along a path which is parallel to the axis, to that continuous point in time which may be millennia BC, where the box originally emerged. In effect, one goes forward with the flow along the time axis and back around the circumference of the sphere, which is time. And there we enter the time axis chamber again and are carried forward along the flow to our own present time. He smiled. Do you see what that means? It means that one day those four in the Laurentian cavern will waken. And as they wake, as they step out, three men and a woman will enter the chamber and begin their journey into time. I gave my head a quick shake. Images were whirling in it like sparks from a 4th of July pinwheel. None of them made sense to me, or perhaps only one. But that one was definite. Oh no, they won't, I said. Why not? I will quote you a vulgarism, I said meticulously. There may be flies on some of you guys, but there ain't no flies on me. I'm not going. I know when I'm well off. Jerry Cortland is staying right here with both feet firm upon his own temporal axis. I will write you the best story you ever saw about yourself, Mr. DeKalb, but I won't climb on any merry-go-rounds with you. Is that clear? He chuckled deeply. But you did, Mr. Cortland. You did.